We always start a lecture with Norwegian words that you have to know. And you might have realized that when you meet Norwegian, they say, hi. That is uh, international and means hallo, or hi, or good dog. That's the Norwegian word for today, OK? Good dog. Repeat after the Norwegian during the break, good dog, or hi. Last week, we learned one thing. And none of you remembers. Why do we export? And the answer is to pay for import. So that was the first thing you <coughs> learned one week ago. Today we will learn why is trade uh, gaining uh, or a gain for any country that trades. Okay? So one thing you will learn before you leave is trade creates gains for all countries involved. So now you can just pack up, go home, because that's what you're going to learn during this class. <coughs> OK. Uh, I have given you a draft for the lectures uh, for the coming weeks. And I don't see Stian here, do I? Or Lena? No. Here comes at least Arthur and Guillaume. There is a copy here. There is a seat there. OK. okay. So we will, as soon as Arthur is seated, run through a plan for the lectures the next 13 weeks. So if you wonder what you're going to do on Wednesdays from now on in 13 weeks is, is be here and see what happens, OK? But you will have a chance to influence the plan. Is that a deal, too? So I have just, uh, let's say, designed the first four lectures. And then it's up to you to decide for the rest. So it means that you have at least a week to think of it. You can meet at fractions like they do in the EU Parliament, the green side, the centre side, and the lefties, and then you can discuss uh, any suggestion. But my suggestion is that the first four uh, lectures will be as I have decided. That's the way we work as dictators, and we call ourselves lectures. But we are not supported by the military that they used to be in Brazil, so that is the difference. So there will be no guns or cannons or things like that. You will have a chance to influence this, OK? Is that a fair deal? I mean, it's in the middle of the week. It's still not weekend, so it's OK? Yeah, then we do it like that. Today, we run through what we call the introduction. <coughs> then we say a few words about what is, in fact, world trade, as we can see when you look around. After that, we say, we can explain trade as a gravity model. And none of you are relatives of Darwin or of Isaac Newton. But you have heard of him. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually the physics of this class. Okay? It's a gravity model. It means that distance influence trade. So if you wonder why Brazil is only exporting coffee to Norway, and not cars, uh, fresh bananas, and things like that, <laughs> it's simply because they are too far away. But they have one advantage in the gravity model, and that is they are a big economy. So bigger economies trade more than smaller. So now you've learned two other things today. Big countries export more than small economies. And close countries import and export more with each other than faint or far away countries. So if you wonder why we don't buy Italian skis, it's simply because the Norwegian skis are better. So instead, we buy wine and cheese from Italy. I don't think that's a fair deal, isn't it? Yeah. We can also explain why we export skis to Finland or France 
because some of the French uh, cross-country skiers use Norwegian skis. And that is a fair, let's say, it's a fair reason for doing that. We'll come back to it later, not today, okay? So far, so good. Uh, none of you know Ricardo, but you will before you leave today. Four, Ricardo's main point is this. It's comparative advantages that explain traits. So you have to compare two countries. One country can have absolute advantage, but what explains trade is simply compare them to each other, and that explains it. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, we come up with one of, let's say, the main theme of international trade, and that is production possibilities in a country. Not too much. I mean, we have three hours, and you can survive with those subjects. No complaints, no protesting, no orange revolution go ongoing like in Kiev. No. Okay. Then we go on. And for those coming in late, we have extra service of copies. You're welcome. And all of the others come. This is the textbook. In fact, it looks like this in the modern version. And then there are at least four Norwegians wondering, could I read this in Norwegian? And the answer is a slight similar version in Norwegian. So this is for the Norwegians that are not very fond of reading English. So on, let's say, uh, black days when you feel everything is turning against you, just look up that book. But this is the good one, OK? Yeah. And for those Norwegians that ask for a Norwegian textbook, imagine being a Brazilian in Norway having to read English. So for solidarity, I hope most of you read the English version. Is that a fair deal, too? Because I think this is better but it's in English. <coughs> what is it about is simply the best textbook ever. As Samaran would have said if this had been the Olympic Games in Norway last time. So therefore, read Krugman. It is a big book with a lot of pages. And since you are very good economists, guess why there are so many pages in Krugman's textbook? That's a lot of job. Yeah, but they get paid for every page they write. We call it, let's say, a not very good incentive system. So hadn't it been for all the pages they wrote, they would have got less money. But I think the textbook could have been a little bit better if we drop some of the American football uh, examples during the text. Much better with Brazilian football. Yeah. So uh, why Neymar is not playing a goalkeeper is simply because he's compared to the other, not the best goalkeeper. So that is comparative advantage. So if you wonder why Neymar is not a keeper, goalkeeper of Brazil, the answer is comparative advantage. So far, so good. <coughs> Krugman discusses a lot of subjects, uh, controversial uh, say positions on international trade. This book is written in 1993. So they celebrate a 21st anniversary. But most of these articles are in or these articles are included in the textbook. So if you wonder, do I have to read that one? The answer is no, not as long as you read Krugman's textbook. OK? So don't wake up with a nightmare and think, oh, I haven't read pop internationalism in the last week. No problem. It's in the textbook. <coughs> uh, 
and it's still recording. Four parts. Part one, trade theory. Part two, trade policy. Part three, exchange rate. And do you know what an exchange rate is? Yeah. So coming into Norway, you could, of course, try to bargain with the local shop and say, I only got euros. But you will be better off if you exchange it into Norwegian money. OK? And for those of you who arrived after Christmas, there is one comfort. The value of Norwegian krone is now lower than it was before. So hopefully, you didn't exchange before you came. Or did you? Pity. That's what we call risk. Can be a lot. The last part is what we call international microeconomic policy, which simply is try to coordinate international uh, economic policy. Why do we ask for international microeconomic macroeconomic policy right now? is simply because in we are in a deep recession with too little uh, spending in all of the world's economies, except for Norway, probably Brazil, and a few others. So that asks for international, uh, let's say, policy. And one could be coordinate macroeconomic policy. So when I look around, I can see at least one of you that have a course in macroeconomics. One and two. Okay, <laughs> you've heard of it. Only microeconomics. Okay, this is the other one. But today we're going to learn about basic trade theory. We use the Ricardo m model to start to explain trade. This is not the only one, but this is the simplest one. So we do what we always do. We start with the simplest version. It's like learning to b bicycle. The first one is with two extra wheels and your mother or father behind to keep it balancing. This is the way uh, Krugman does it. The simple version of trade theory to explain why do countries trade. Focused on comparative advantages, uh, it starts the presentation of trade theory. Welcome. And even have a nice day. We'll see at the end of the lecture if it's right. Who was the first one to write about trade or economics? Was, of course, English. His name is David Hume. He's not a Scottish prime minister because they still don't have one. But I try to vote in one. He writes an article in 1758. It's about 255 years ago. So it's not quite new. You cannot look it up on Google, because it's not in one of the dailies that you can find today. But this is probably the first article that analyzes economic subjects. <coughs> Sorry, based upon you, and none of you are in the video yet, but based upon you, trade is creating gains for countries involved. It influences the pattern of trade depending on different factors, but that will come back to it. The second one is some countries do not like to trade. We call it protectionism. He discusses that as well. When you trade, you have to pay for it. And then we come up with what we call balance of payment, which simply means if we buy something, we have to pay for it. If we sell something, we got paid for it. And the balance between what we sell and buy gives us the balance of payment. What happens if the balance of payment is, let's say, minus for a longer period? Yes? Maybe, um, yeah, the economics of the country will collapse. Or 
about the exchange rate would be yes. So it can also be adjusted by exchange rate. Uh, when I look around and ask the Norwegians, have there been a period where the Norwegian economy have been running with a deficit on the balance of payment, let's say for at least 10 years? Not too many years ago. And the answer is, of course, 1970s. Why did Norway have a balance of payment deficit in the 70s? The international students are free, but... Because of the oil crisis. On the contrary. We introduced the oil or petrol sector into Norwegian economy. What knowledge did we have in that activity was clear, close to nil. So we had to buy the competence. We had to buy the capital let's say the equipment. We have to buy the Americans who came in to start it. Why did the Americans come in to start this and give us money to do it? Well, simply they expected to earn money from it in the future. And when I look around and see the Norwegian and say, did they earn money in the future, let's say 20 years later, in the 90s? And the answer is, which is, yes, they did. So in the period when you build up an industry, like we did in Norway, we need to import what we need to produce. When we start to produce, we pay back by exporting uh, what you produce. Do we earn money from this nowadays in Norway? Uh -huh. Because of, uh, you export it uh, mainly to lower prices, uh -huh. but uh, from exports to other countries that uh, uh, needed maybe gas or something else, yeah. what we have uh, produced. And we call it the Petroleum Fund. Guess how much money there is in the Norwegian Petroleum Fund right now? Norwegian citizen about one million kron. Yeah, and since we are five, this is mathematics. How much money is it in this if every Norwegian have one million Norwegian krona and it's five million of us? Then it's five thousand billions krona. Is that a, some money to let's say have in the bank and use for the future? <coughs> of course it is. So this is one of the biggest funds in the world, thanks to what we did in the 70s, where we run the economy at a deficit on the balance on payment. So don't worry if you are not Greece, because if they run at the balance of payment <coughs> problems now, their problem is they need more tourists. And since all of the international students are coming to Norway, that's bad for Greek tourism. So that's the difference. So we can run at the deficit of a longer period. And don't worry, be happy, because we are going to create more money in the future. We call it risk handling and funding problems. And that will be mentioned later, at the end of the course. But we have to mention this. Is that a deal? We cannot leave this course without having mentioned why we have a Norwegian Petroleum Fund, can we? At least we have to tell the incoming students why we have it. So they will learn how to do it. OK? So that is the basic content of the textbook. Proven by Ricardo 200 years ago. The other models are more complex or complicated. So the first one is the simple version. And then we start to, let's say, uh, make the trade tra tra theory wider. So we start only with the simple one, and gradually we move into the other ones. If I say large-scale economies, have you heard of it? Can you mention, let's say, an international company that obviously have large-scale economies, and you use <coughs> them every day? Not all of you, but a few of you. 
iPod. So iPhone is Apple's product, obviously, producing at the large scale economies, which simply means the more they produce, the cheaper every unit. Yes. Okay? And then we have the other one. Inside that one is Microsoft. <coughs> obviously, <coughs> large scale economies. So large scale economies simply means the more you produce, the lower will be the cost. And some of you flew in, didn't you? But not by the Norwegian Dreamliner, I hope. Because then you wouldn't have come yet. You will be, uh, uh, let's say, delayed somewhere out in the world because it's not always flying. Okay? <coughs> the Dreamliner is a mm, European aircraft. But most of the aircrafts are not produced in Europe, but in US. Why do they produce so much aircraft or flying objects in US? It's probably because of large scale economies. They have the advantage, they started this first, now they can produce it at a lower unit cost, so it's hard to compete with them. So that is also explaining trade. Large scale economies. Okay? So trade can also be trading in future labor. As we said, shifting money is a risky business. So exchange <coughs> can also be exchange of risky assets. And none of you ever bought derivatives during the financial crisis, I see, because you are here. If not, you would have been at home and be a poor guy without a work in southern Greece and where you dream of the housing bubble in the US every morning because that's where the money went. It was too risky. Okay, we said, uh, we mentioned Norway in the 70s. Sometimes it can be wise, not always. There is, of course, negative effects to trade. But that is within countries, not between countries. So if you wonder what is negative, it's simply <coughs> because it's inside the economy. So the problem appears if you are a low wage, unskilled worker, only making fillets out of fish in northern Norway, and they can do it deep cheaper in China. But none of you are coming from northern Norway, are you? Or did you come here to study because you lost your job in Honingsvog or in Westerholm? No. You came for different reasons. But that could be one reason. You move away from, let's say, working because this is not uh, generating enough money to survive. So within countries, there can be negative effects, but wait for that till later. What kind of patterns do we see in trade? You will see when you read the textbook. But we'll show you a few examples during the class. <coughs> Why don't we produce coffee in Norway? and the climate. Why do they produce it in Brazil? <laughs> because of the climate and the weather. So part of trade is explained by climate. Okay? But we do not sell ice cream in Norway because of the climate. Is that also clear? Yeah. Uh, resources. Why do we produce a lot of oil and gas in Norway? It's simply because yeah. we have a lot of it. There are a lot of resources in here. <laughs> They have in Brazil two years, but we have, uh, compared to what we use, even more than you yet. Uh, I think we are only uh, outrun by Venezuela. But you have never been to Venezuela. No. I think that is the difference. Uh, so sometimes it's only random variables. Why do we produce a cheese uh, slicer in Norway? It's simply because 
one Norwegian was tired of using the knife. So that is random. So there's no reason to, let's say, come up with a model that explains that in Norway they produce cheese sliders. <laughs> so that is something different. So something is random. Okay. Why do or did Sweden produce a lot of gunpowder uh, a little bit more than a hundred years ago? There was a Swedish guy, his name was Alfred Nobel. And he is given the name of a price, but he was a gun product. And that is random. If he had been born in Germany, there would be no Nobel Peace Prize. But that's a different story. Okay? So some of the explain for trade is simply random. Sheer luck. Okay? So far, so good. I think they sometimes blink, but I don't think it's because of the video. But it might be a sign that one of you have to come, by, come here and say, hi, mama, I'm still here. It's still light in here, so don't worry, and go back to the seat, and we go in. Okay? So that might be, but until then, we don't know. Chapter 9 and 10, I think we have to run through. So if you try to negotiate what chapters we can run through, you already lost the battle of 9 and 10. Is that a deal? You had a chance, but that was before the course started, and you didn't know that you had the chance. OK? We have to talk about globalization. We have to do <coughs> talk about what happened inside and between countries. And we have to say something about balance of payments. Exchange rate determination, too. And uh, we now argue for chapter 9. If you wonder why this is written, it's simply the argument for choosing chapter 9 as part of the textbook. So what you can do is, during Friday's party, come up with a long list of arguments against chapter 9. But I'm not willing to get bailed out. I'm not an American bank. It's not in the middle of the finance crisis. So try 11, 12, or 30. Wait till after 10. Is that a deal? OK? Uh, we have to say something about uh, movement of money between countries. <coughs> because part of this is tangible. Do you know what tangible is? Why is this tangible? You can touch it. Bring it with you. But you can also read this on internet. But then it is intangible. Is that a deal? So this is tangible in the sense that you can take it with you and read it on your bed or on the bus or during the party. It's a very sad party and things like that. But it's also intangible in the sense that you can find it on the internet and you can read it there. <coughs> and then it is what we call intangible. And some of that is financial transfers. Do you know how it works? Do any of you have cards? I mean, not postcards, but credit cards? Do you pay in the shop or <coughs> in Norwegian hard kroners? Or you pay with card? Yeah. That is what we call intangible financial transfers. If I want to buy myself a waffle, I can come up with the hard currency. But you can also use a card. So that is what we call financial transfer. That is important to understand uh, international economics. So you have to learn a little bit about financial transfers too. Was that too fast? No. OK? So that is the basic uh, content of the textbook. How many pages? Well, not less than 200. Because those three I saw in a course, we had a textbook more than 200 pages. They managed 200 in the first semester, far away from home. And this is easier to read than the textbook they had, so at least 300 pages. Is that a deal? So 13 hours, well, classes, 300 pages, it's about 
between 25 and 40 pages per lecture. Is that okay? No one objects. Okay, then we say something around 40 pages, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more, but you have to spend part of your weekend reading at least 10 pages. So that's the sad story of it. The nice story is you went out on Friday and the party was okay. And you are in the party. Then we are into Ricardian. <coughs> but to understand what trade pattern is, look up figure 2-1. It's in there. It explains the trade of the US. What are the most important trade partner of the US? Canada, because it's near. Yeah, but Mexico is also near. Why don't they trade similar amounts with Mexico? Be the economy? Yes. And there is also another additional reason, of course. Same language. Same language. They even have the same culture. And they have relatives across the borders. So therefore, it's close, same culture, speak the same language. If you take a trip around Norway, and if you're not Norwegian, you will see a very strange, uh, let's say, uh, let's call it action, around Easter time. Well, young Norwegians, leave Norway to go to Sweden and trade. Most of the time they do not trade, but they cross over. Why do they cross over? It's simply because they can understand the police when they say, hey guys, this is too nice, cool down. Or they ha would have been in Kiev and they would be arrested and stayed there for three months. So same language is important. Same culture is also important. So if we want to learn Norwegians to eat Brazilian food, there is only one thing we can offer. Coffee. Or bacalao. <laughs> so you drink coffee and eat bacalao. But if you go to Sweden, a lot of these Norwegians have been to Sweden to eat Swedish dishes because it's more or less the same. Tastes the same, costs about the same amount of money to buy, uh, and can be eaten with a fork and knife, unlike sushi, which should have been eaten with sticks. So similar culture also explain trade. So if you are in the US, you either import from Canada and from Mexico, since Canada is bigger, speak the same language, and have more or less the same cultural background, you import more of that than you do from Mexico. OK? Do any of you sometimes watch movies from time to time? Yes. OK. Norwegian movie industry is quite new. Is not correct? We used to see movies made in the Nordic country that was Swedish, because we could understand the plot, understand what the character actually did, different from other countries. So when we can un understand each other, let's say have the same taste, like the same things, we trade more. So that is the reason why we trade. We know what chutbullar is. We call it chutkak in Norwegian, but that is more or less the same. This is the model. To define trade as a function of two major things. One, the size of the economy. If this is Germany, they will import more than Norway, simply because they're bigger, okay? Since this is Germany, they will export more than Norway, simply because it's a bigger economy. Part of this will be to <laughs> Norway. Most of it will be to France, and you know why. Just across the border in Alsace, 
Alsace is now in Germany, isn't it? It used to be in France. So it is just crossing the border. It's the contrary. Hey? It's the reverse. Okay, so the reverse from time. So to be, let's say, to understand trade, you have to go to Alsace Lorraine. You sometimes are in Germany, you sometimes are in France, <laughs> depending on what time it is, okay? But this explains one other important variable, distance between the two countries, okay? Guess who trade most with Luxembourg? Benelux. All the uh, countries surrounding. Not Benelux, because Luxembourg is Luxembourg, and they don't trade with each other. Okay, yeah, but that's right. So most of it is trade with neighboring states. Okay? So why do we export a little bit extra to Germany right now? Because Germany is not our nearest neighbor. That is in Denmark. And between Germany and Norway lies Denmark. And it's a distance between us. Okay, why do we export a lot to Germany right now? Because Germany needs uh, maybe uh, resources from huh? Norway. And guess what we export? Gas and oil. Gas yeah. and oil. Electricity. Electricity too. Because it's not only gas and oil. It's also hydro, uh, electric power. So why do we do it? It's simply because Germany needs more of it, and we have enough, more than enough, if you ask me. Yeah. So part of this is the explained by the size of the economy. Large economies import and export more than smaller. They import and export from the closest countries. So most of it is close to the country. So let's assume that Scotland, uh, let's say, get its independence. Guess who will be the most important importing country for Scotland? England. Because then you have two different states, England and Scotland. And Scotland has only one neighbor, and that's in England. <coughs> Not Scottish football players because they are lousy, but that's a different story. Okay. So trade is explained simply by economy size and distance between the trading countries. What is A? What is A? And I'm afraid one of the answers is Brazil. Do Norwegian drink coffee? What do they need to drink coffee? Sugar. Or coffee beans. Where can they find coffee beans? Not in Norway. So part of this is simply explained by uh, just a random variable, A, that explains this is goods we like to eat or use or uh, consume. But they are not available in Norway. And it's independent on any of the other factors. So it's simply one constant that explains that part of the economy will always be imports. OK? So far, so good. So part of the trade is simply not explainable at all. It's simply because some strange Norwegian one deci once decided that they wanted to sail across the ocean to rob English, English monastery or <coughs> Irish, then they need a boat. So if they didn't have it, they will have to trade it. So part of this cannot be explained by income or distance, but by some vague variable of some kind. Okay? So if you wonder, why do we not import more fish from Australia to Norway? It is because they fish on Iceland, and it's much closer than Australia. So part of this is explained by we trade the food or the product, but from the nearest country. Okay. So if you wake up one morning, and somebody is offering you fish and chips, which is an English tradition. Don't worry, it's not Australian fish, if you're afraid of that. It's too far away. 
So part of this is explained by decreasing distance to the nearest area where you can import it. The last one is on a general form. The first one is on a special form. But they seem to explain the same. <coughs> OK. None of you are from US, as far as I can see. But some of you are from France. So if you go back 200 years in history, you had relatives in US. Or you had American students coming into Paris to learn engineering. Because it was a link between US and France at that time. So if you wander around in any state in US, in a bigger urban area, you will see a French name of the nearest street. One of the most famous one is Lafayette. He was a general. He fought in the Civil War. But why is it so small part of the spending in EU <coughs> and US imported, vice versa, from the two other? Why are there so few American goods consumed in EU? And why are it so few EU goods consumed in US? When this is one of the biggest economic areas in the world. Because other countries like uh, maybe Asia also could produce uh, le for less money. Yeah, but within the recurrent model, model is simply, why go to Europe when you can buy it in Canada? Why go to Europe and can buy it in Mexico? So you have Spanish food in Mexico. Why sail all the way to Europe when you can buy it in Mexico? So that is the simple explanation. It's too far away. Been like that. Uh, I'm wondering because of yeah? uh, today, the costs of transportation is almost nothing. So uh, this is a little bit uh, uh, this uh, a little bit uh, crazy to me. Yeah, yeah. but when you read uh, Krugman, you will soon realize how it is like that. Okay, so in a near future, less than four months ahead, you will know uh, the answer. What people think is trade is very important to a country's economy. The answer is not very big. It's growing, that's right. So distance uh, seems to be have been reduced, or cost has been reduced. But still, import and export is a smaller part of the economy. So that is the answer. You will find the explanation in uh, that textbook before you know. So one day you wake up and say, ah, there it is. And then you can tell the students, either at the party or here. <coughs> but there are some anomalies or exceptions. So before we take the break, and I push the button, why do US trade more with Belgium and the Netherlands than they do with the rest of EU? You have 15 minutes from now on. 